Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. My name is Dan Carver. I'm the technical manager at the Geospatial Centroid. And today we're gonna to be talking about using R for doing some geospatial processing steps on raster data. So within this lesson, we're gonna cover how to read in both raster and vector data with an R. We're going to be clipping, masking, and then projecting that raster data. And then we're gonna take each of these individual steps and wrap them into a really nice function that we can apply over multiple last rasters from a specific locations. Um, and this is really how you go about developing automated workflows. Find something that works for one feature and then find a way to be able to apply it to multiple features of the same data type. So before we get into the coding, I just want to highlight a few of the features that we're working with here today. So natural earth data, we're using their highest resolution uh, admin layers for countries. Uh, for our vector data, we pulled some of the 10 minute world bioclimactic variables from WorldClim2, um, great uh, open source data set here. And then we're working with India specifically. So for projection information, I went to spatialreference.com and found a Albert's equal area projection for India. Um, for our work, we need this proj4 uh, string. So we're gonna be pulling this into our code base uh, and working with that. I have these files just sitting in a file location. So uh, countries, that contains my country shape file. And then we have four images that we're working with. So that's the prep, everything's ready to go. So let's move into the code itself. Let me clear out all this information. So we're working with a fresh script. So something that I recommend when you're working on developing a new methodology is just to create an outline. Uh, so you know what you're gonna need to do to run this process conceptually. Uh, you're gonna have to bring in libraries. You're gonna have to point to where all those files are. Um, in this case, we have a couple different steps. So we're reading in the raster data, we're reading in the shape files, processing that shape file, and then by the time we get to here, this is processing rasters. Uh, so rather than run through this and spend a bunch of time typing out, what I've done is I basically filled out this outline. Um, so this covers our basic steps of cropping and masking and then reprojecting. And then down here we have our elements for creating a function. So instead of typing that all out, I just had the code all ready to go and written up here. And so we're just gonna run this through line by line. I'll talk through what's going on, uh, why we are doing it and so on. So we need a couple of libraries uh, to work with our processes effectively. So raster is one, SF is one. We don't actually need S. Uh, it's the other spatial library for working with vector data. So let's just get rid of that. We want TMAP and we also want library dplyr. Great. So within the TMAP library, there is a parameter called TMAP mode. Uh, we're gonna set that equal to plot. So what that means is then when we make our maps and we view them over in our studio, um, it's gonna be projecting static maps, which are, they render a lot faster. So our base directory, this is just a path that's saved as an object. So we're pointing it to what is effectively the directory above where our files are held. And um, so, we're pointing it to vid one, and we'll be able to use a relative path to get at the data from there. So back to the script. To read in the raster data, uh, 
this is the full path to the feature. We know that our base path, base directory, is all the way up to vid1. So we can just replace this with paste o base directory comma vid1 tiff and close out the parentheses here. So we read in that raster object. Let's print it really quick. We can see it's a raster layer extent. It's in lat long um, min max values. We can call from tmap the function qtm and pass it a spatial feature, in this case a raster. And then it's going to give us a plot of that feature so we can get a sense of it. So it is a worldwide uh, feature of this is average yearly temperature. So that's great. We read it in, no problem. Here we have to read in our shape file. So much like before, we can replace this whole section with paste base directory. Add another parentheses on the end here. Um, I really like doing this because uh, I work on a couple different machines. So it's easy to update one feature and make sure the code runs. And then also if I'm working on multiple scripts at a time, um, some funky things can happen using set working directory. So I've just moved to uh, having this relative path structure with paste. You don't have to use it, it's up to you. So when we read in our shapefile object using the library SF and function ST read, uh, we get some parameters that come out of it. So we could see it's an Esri shapefile. It's got 255 features and 94 fields. Uh, it's also in WGS84 unprojected lat long. Great. And because it's an SF object, it is really nice because it, it basically works like a data frame would in R. So we can take a look at it. Uh, if we know we want to pull out India, so let's just filter for India. Great. We'll copy that value. And we could see that where admin is equal to India. Yeah, that's what we want. So we can use a deep dplyr um, piping to push that through. And then we have a new object called India, which is one feature, 94 fields, same projection, different extent so on and so on. If we wanted to, we could take a quick look at that object as well. Cool. Looks like the subcontinent of India, so we're good to go. All right, so we have our raster, we have our area, and now we need to relate the two. So there are a few ways to do this. Um, I just wanted to point out in this lesson that you can use extent objects. So within the raster library, there's a function called extent. And if we run that on a spatial feature and take a look, we get uh, what is an extent object. So it's in the class extent. Uh, so this is just a really simple x min, x max, y min, y max. And we can use that to uh, as a parameter within quite a few of the raster functions. So raster crop here, which is going to be what we're going to be using to um, drop our world raster down to a specific area. We're just going to input our feature that we read in our raster here and then our extent object R2. Let's take a look. Yep. So there's the Indian subcontinent, and it's got the whole bounding box. Um, just to check, if I were to call R2 but pass India instead, 
Yeah. I get the same thing. It's hard to tell, but we're moving back and forth between the features and they're the same. So you don't need to use extent objects. Sometimes it's just easier uh, to do so because um, your extent object could be a bounding box that you created and not necessarily a spatial feature. So now that we've got that cropped, it's a much smaller raster. So let's look at this. Its dimensions are 30,000 cells. If we look back at R1, we had over 2 million cells. So we've really dramatically reduced the size of this raster. And that means that any geoprocessing step from here on out is going to be a lot faster. So cropping is usually the first thing you want to do when you're doing geoprocessing of large features. So our object here is R2, and we're just going to pass it into the mask function from the raster library now. And we're going to mask it to our SF object, not the extent object. We want all the details um, of the coastlines and whatnot. So that ran nice and fast. And then we can see we get this nice cookie cutter effect where we've pulled out the extent of the country. So that's looking good. Um, just to double check, our R3 is the same number of cells, but all this white space is now NA values. So they're not holding really any information. Um, and it's this is specific to this geographic extent we're interested in. Um, however, our feature is still in the WGS84, so it's not projected. So in order to project this, uh, we need to do two things. And the first one is to create a CRS object, a coordinate reference system object. So we use, again, the library raster here, uh, the function CRS, and then we just pass it the string that we got from our spatial reference uh, website here. So I just copied and pasted this, brought it into the code, dropped it in here. And then if we run this, and let's just take a look at what this object is. We can see that's a CRS R argument. Um, so this is a specific data type that is needed by the project raster function. Um, project raster is a super powerful function. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, there's a lot of parameters that it can take in. It's like you could pass it uh, one raster and you want it to match the, uh, you know, the extent, resolution, whatnot of another one and it'll make that transformation using to and from. In our case, we're only interested in changing the coordinate reference system of this raster. So we can simply just push in our feature here, uh, as well as the new CRS object that we just created, the called proj, and then we run it. So now India 2, which is a raster layer. I don't like this name. Changed it to R4, rerun. Um, pretty fast, I have to say. So let's take a quick look at R4. Uh, number of cells has changed a little bit. But more importantly, we have new units are meters. Uh, the extents all in meters rather than lat long. Uh, and then this is an equal area projection. So if you want to do percent land cover analysis or anything like that, you can actually use the numbers out of this um, very effectively. So quick, just checking back in with our objectives. Uh, we just clipped, masked, and projected a raster data set. Um, in order to do that, we needed to read in that raster and that vector data. So that's great. We got this 
basic workflow down, but now how do we apply that to all the four rasters in the list? Um, I know when I first started doing this type of work, my inclination was just to go to uh, the copy and paste function. So I would grab all my code that I used already, copy it, do the next raster, change one parameter for it, so on and so on. Um, that's really cumbersome and tiring as you go on. So what we're gonna do instead is wrap this whole process up into a function. And then we're gonna be able to really efficiently apply that function to different features within uh, our file structure. So let's take a look at our function. Create function. We're calling it clip mask project or clip mask pro. You can call it whatever you want. Um, we're defining that it's a function, and then there's going to be three parameters. So these parameters only exist within the function itself, um, which is why I can use whatever term I want here. They could be X, Y, Z, but um, I tend to like descriptive parameters. So we have an input raster, we have a polygon that's used to crop and mask that feature. And then we have a projection, which is gonna be that CRS argument that we need for the project raster function. A nice thing about the raster uh, library is that we can use our dplyr piping uh, to push the end result of the function above into the next function below it. So our raster becomes the input parameter to crop. It gets cropped based on the extent of that polygon, the bounding box of it. Um, that cropped raster image becomes the input to the mask that gets masked to the specific extent of that polygon. And then that masked image, this is now reduced in size and everything, is pushed into the project raster function and it reassigns that CRS to equal what we define at the top of the function. So we save that all as an output R1 and then we return R1. What does this look like in real life? We have a new parameter, we'll call it feature, we'll call our function, I need to run this. Um, Kind of an important thing to note here is that when you do run a function, it shows up in your parameters as a function, uh, and then you can actually view it there. So if you have to save someone else, um, you can get at it pretty quickly and easily. So, so we define parameter one raster, that's gonna be R1, that's our initial feature that we put in. Our polygon is going to be India, so that's our filtered data set. And then our projection is going to be our CRS argument proj. So we can run that, and then we get feature. And feature should be a raster layer. Yep, it's projected in our reference system, coordinate reference system, that looks right. The name held through, min max values look like they're there. Let's take a quick look at it, see if it matches our expectations. Yeah, still looks like India. Okay. All right, so now take a quick back, look back. We notice we have our four files in our uh, folder here. So we want to run this function on each one of those files. So we're going to get an output for these parameters, um, a raster output for each one of these. We can do that. In order to do that, we need to bring these into our, our environment. So we can do that using the list file functions. Um, Within list file, I can just throw in my base directory. So that's where it's gonna look for features. We want to 
specifically identify features that have a specific pattern. So all the stuff that we're interested in are going to have a dot tiff on their ending. We're going to pull the full file names. So it's going to give from the, the absolute directly going to the files rather than just the name of the files. And then recursive means that it'll filter through and down uh, subsequent levels of file folders. So we don't have to point at the exact folder we want features from, we can point above it. So we call that, let's take a look at what it returns. So you see here, this is a complete path to our four TIFFs that we're interested in. Okay. So now that we have that, let's look here. We're going to call the sequence along function on our rasters. So that gives us one, two, three, four. So I becomes one, two, three, four. We can use that to index our, our vector of raster paths up here. So we're gonna select the first one. We're gonna read that in as a raster. And then that becomes the input parameter, the input raster for our clip mask project function. Okay, and the results for that is going to be uh, another raster and lists are really effective tools for storing all types of data, but we can store rasters in them as well, complex objects. So we can create an empty list called results doesn't have anything in it, it's just a list. And we're going to assign position one in that list is going to be equal to the first output from our clip mask project function. Um, I threw a print statement in here because any geoprocessing, it could take a long time, you want to be able to track, but let's just run our loop. Great, we get some warning messages about depreciated features. Now let's look at results. So in our results, we have four raster layers. Uh, they all have the same CRS. They all have the same extent. Uh, we've kept the name and the positioning is right. So we know how to draw them out. And then if we wanted to just take a quick look Let's call QTM. Uh, results, position four. Yeah, so here is a, a new data set. It matches what we've been seeing before, but a different parameter. Um, so if you wanted to, you could write out these fun these features. Uh, you know, you could write them out instead of storing them in the list right away. You could have a just temp object, and then you can do raster, write raster, T1, and you could provide a file name. That's gonna be our base directory. Uh, so on and so on, and then just come back and say, you know, results position I is equal to T1. So lots that you can do, but this is just a wonderful tool to basically take care of a huge chunk of geoprocessing in a consistent and uh, dependable format. So this little chunk of code that we talked about um, is, is gonna be available to you uh, linked in the YouTube description. Uh, all the data that I used in this example will be listed there as well. And I hope you appreciated this and looking forward to seeing you in the next one.